Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, the topic is antibiotic use and overuse for animals. Dr. David Walinga, Senior Health Official at the National Resources Defense Council, talks to Dr. Josh Sharfstein about efforts to reduce unnecessary antibiotic use on farms around the world. Let's listen. Dr. David Walinga, thank you so much for joining me on Public Health On Call. We're going to talk about the use and overuse of antibiotics. I'm happy to be here. So talk to me about antibiotics. I know you spend a lot of time thinking about them. Why should we be concerned about the overuse of antibiotics? Yeah, well, I'll say the first thing, which is obvious, is that antibiotics have become absolutely essential for a lot of what we see as sort of the miracle of modern medicine. You have a major procedure like a surgery or even a C-section. You get cancer and go on chemotherapy. you diabetic and you need to go on dialysis. All these things are things that are complicated by bacterial infections pretty commonly. So like it's hard to do those life-saving procedures if you can't count on antibiotics to work if you get an infection. That's why we all want antibiotics that work. The problem is that the more we use antibiotics for whatever reason, the more we select for the strains of bacteria that we can't treat with those antibiotics. And that's become a bigger and bigger problem in the US and really in all parts of the world. We're using too many antibiotics. And after having done that for decades, it's catching up with us. And the number of really drug-resistant, deadly infections is rising. So if overusing antibiotics causes drug resistance, the solution is to reduce the use. So where are antibiotics used? Well, they're used in human settings. That's what most people are familiar with. You either go to a clinic or you end up sick in the hospital. And for one reason or another, your caregiver says, hey, I think you've got an infection. We're going to treat it. So that's where some of the use happens. The shocker is that that's not even close to the majority of how the antibiotics that we rely on in human medicine are actually used. Most of the use, both in the U.S. and globally, is actually in producing food animals. Same antibiotics, penicillins, tetracyclines, erythromycins, cephalosporins. Those are all human class drugs, but they're also used in food animals and often for reasons that aren't necessary at all. Just to make sure I'm getting this, 80% of antibiotic use, the antibiotic use that could drive drug resistance may be in animals. That's the best estimate we have, yeah, 80%. And which animals are we talking about? Uh, We're talking about anything people across the world raise for food. So it's meat animals, sure, but it's also dairy animals, goat's milk, cow's milk, it's fish. Increasingly, the wild populations of fish are declining. So people are using the oceans intensively to farm, whether it's shrimp or certain kinds of fish. They use antibiotics in all those places. And like I said, oftentimes, those uses aren't really necessary. We can talk a little bit more how we know that. But the other thing is that unlike some of the use in humans, a lot of the animal use is invisible. Nobody's tracking it. Nobody wants to look at it. And as a result, there's very little tracking or surveillance of use, even though it's like one of the most important things we need to know about antibiotics. I want to ask you about all those things. But first, I want to double check with you that animal antibiotic use really matters for humans. Is there evidence that the use of antibiotics by animals contributes to drug resistance in humans could affect someone in the hospital? Yeah, there's decades of evidence and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And still, there are folks that say we don't have enough evidence. We need more evidence, just like something else that we're experiencing, namely climate change. For decades, we knew that it was a problem. And yet there's always folks that want more evidence because they don't really want to do anything about the current practices. So the evidence is hard to understand because resistance is a complicated thing. 
And there's evidence from a lot of different domains. So there's basic microbiology, even the discoverer of antibiotics. If you go back and look at the Nobel Prize that he got in medicine for figuring out penicillin and how to turn it into a human therapy, he said, you know what? We've got to be really careful because the urge is going to be to use this for everything. But we know, and this was back in the 1920s, by the way, he said, we know that the more we use it, the faster these little bugs that we're trying to fight are going to get resistant to this miracle drug penicillin. And that's exactly what happened. People sort of indiscriminately use penicillin and pretty soon they're like, you know, penicillin's not working so well anymore. Let's move to other stuff. And then we've done the same thing. We've overused every new class of drugs that we developed. And so is it true that the genetic markers of resistance exist in animals and that those genetic markers can move from animals to humans as the bacteria move? There is all those things. There is direct evidence that sometimes farmers fall sick from the same drug resistance strain that their animals have. That's extraordinarily hard data to collect because there's no incentive in our medical system to collect data from humans and animals and correlate it. But we have found it nonetheless. There's evidence tracking new strains of super drug resistant bacteria, super bugs, and tracking them as they travel from farm environments to human environments and back again. There's no like defined border between these different places. The bugs travel where they want to travel. We're just not very good at tracking them because we haven't wanted to put the money into it. But when people look hard and they do like very cutting edge genetic profiling, they're able to see how these new kinds of resistance not only travel with the bacteria, but jump from one bacteria class to another. And they don't even have to be related. Sometimes those forms of resistance, uh, the genes that make these different bacteria resistant, they jump from like gram negative bacteria to gram positive bacteria. So I've got the message here that we have to be concerned about the use of antibiotics in animals, that there's a huge amount of use. Now, earlier you said not all of it's needed. Why are animals getting antibiotics? Well, hypothetically, there's different ways they get it. We know there's different reasons they get it. Across the world, they get it when the animals are sick. You got a sick animal, you give them an injection of antibiotic if they're really sick because you don't want to lose your animal. You've got money and hair tied up in that animal. But it's been pretty clear for a very, very long time that that's the vast minority of use. Individual sick animal, treat sick animal, animal gets better. Most of the antibiotics that are important to people are put into animal feed and fed to groups of animals. And oftentimes, it's not for the fact that they're sick. In fact, much of the time, there's no evidence that they're sick animals. And so they're used either to promote more rapid growth of animals, and that went on in the U.S. for decades, totally avoidable use, but they did it anyway. And for years, they said there's no evidence that using these antibiotics for promoting growth in animals is a problem, but that proved not to be true. So now that still goes on in much of the world, just not in Europe and not in the U.S. Unfortunately, even though our federal agencies stopped that practice, they allowed some of the same antibiotics to be fed to groups of animals in the same way at about the same dose for about the same length of time. They just give it a different name. They call it disease prevention rather than growth promotion. So you mentioned Europe. Europe has taken a somewhat different tack than the United States. Europe's taken the completely opposite tack to the United States. Europe set out with a strategic plan starting on or around 2009. And Europe said the big problem with antibiotics is when we use them when they're unnecessary. So we already know that if you keep animals healthier in the first place, they're not going to get sick and they're not going to need antibiotics. Our whole plan is going to be based around keeping animals healthier by doing a slew of different things giving them more vaccines, treating them better, using stronger breeds, not crowding them, not shipping them around places. All of these are things that we don't do as well in the United States. So Europe reasoned that we're going to do all those alternatives to keep animals healthy. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to really build a region-wide system that tracks all antibiotic use. We're going to track it in medicine. We're going to track it in people. We're going to track it in animals. 
And then we're going to track it from year to year and see if all these different efforts we're doing actually make a difference. And so I'm sure people who are listening are wondering, well, what happened in Europe? Where did the animals not grow? Did they see benefits in terms of antibiotic resistance? What have been the outcomes? Well, Europe as a region is dozens of countries. The best data we have is for the 25 or 26 largest countries who have been doing this tracking the longest period of time. So in the 10 years between 2011 and 2021, collectively, those countries, which represent like 95% of the animal production in Europe, cut their antibiotic use in half. And they're continuing to cut it year by year. Some of those individual countries, which are really quite big producers of animals for food, have cut it by 70%. To me, that says only 30% of what we used to use was actually necessary because we've taken steps and proved it to be unnecessary. And so the animals are still growing? Animals are growing. Their their industries are profitable. In fact, in some cases in Denmark and in the Netherlands, their industries have grown but they're using drastically fewer antibiotics. And in some cases, they can track where as the animal use went down, the human infections due to some of those bacteria are less resistant. Not all, but some of them. And it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, they've drastically reduced their overall use of antibiotics, and they know that that's going to prove beneficial to public health in the long term and the short term. Back in the United States, there has not been a comparable effort to reduce antibiotic use in animals. Is that fair to say? That's more than fair to say. Unlike Europe, the U.S. has not set any goals to reduce antibiotic use. The U.S. doesn't even say that it's a worthwhile thing to reduce antibiotic use in animals. In fact, you remember from your own time when President Obama's administration set up a federal group of experts called PACCARB, right? There's a new leader of PACCARB, and he's a veterinarian, and his position is that we shouldn't talk at all about reducing antibiotics in animals. So very different, it sounds like. And you mentioned earlier that there are some gaps in the data to even understand antibiotic use in animals in this country. Yeah. So what we know and what we have figured out time and time again in the human setting is that you can't really get a handle on where antibiotics are being overused, that is, used unnecessarily or misused, unless you're tracking the use where it happens. So somehow you've got to figure out why people who are prescribing antibiotics are prescribing them. you got to figure out what's their motivation. So you have to collect data to answer those questions. It can't just be sales data because it's too generic. You need data from the prescriber or from the pharmacy or or wherever that tells you the patterns of use. And then you can start answering the question of like, gee, that's funny. Why are they doing that? And can't we get rid of that? And that's exactly what's not happening on U.S. farms in U.S. policy. We're not tracking use as it's occurring in agriculture at all. How long have you worked on this issue of animal antibiotic use? since 2000, so 23 years. So you've seen a lot of change in Europe. You've seen some change in the United States. As you look forward, what do you think the prospects are for progress in this country? In the near term, pretty dismal. In the longer term, it depends on how many people die. Because the longer we delay at doing these very basic public health things, the more people die. That's going to happen regardless of the U.S. does a good job leading because these are global bugs. But the U.S. has a better chance of getting a handle on it the more data they collect in the near term and the more they do to reduce use that's unnecessary. Dr. David Willinga, thank you for coming to talk to me about this and thanks for your work to protect us all. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email 
to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.